Okay, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on our biweekly call, the proposed project plan, Return to Travel. Uh, I did miss you all last week and so uh, the week before, and I am sorry that I did have a scheduling conflict. But we are back again, and we have an exciting call today, and I'm really, really happy uh, to have our guest here. I just wanted to introduce our organizational team, uh, who has been very instrumental in putting these calls together. And for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Carmen Smith. I am the Senior Manager of Travel and Events for ICF. And ICF is a global consulting firm. And we say global consulting with a twist, because we do have some creative types on all of our teams. And anything that is globally and socially impactful, ICF is involved in. Uh, part of this organizational team includes Andrew Wilcox. He is the manager of travel for Europe and Asia for ICF. Charlie Grappon is the director of sales. Uh, he sits in New York City and he's with Citizen M Hotels. Roman Neumeister, who is formerly of the World Bank. Uh, Roman has taken a new position uh, back in Vienna and he will be uh, working overseas. Uh, so he is um, formerly of the World Bank. Kathy Rigby, Program Manager for Travel, Risk, and Safety. She's with CFA Institute. And then also part of my team is Tanya Fairball and Carly Van Dyke. Uh, Tanya is a Purchasing Associate, and Carly is the Travel and Events Assistant uh, here at ICF. And so today's call, I uh, have some housekeeping uh, things that we want to talk about. So this session is recorded. And those uh, links will go out to you, as well as a copy of this presentation uh, in the PDF form will be posted and presented to you. We will also be posting on the GBTA forum uh, in the think tank uh, section of that forum. Please mute your phones. Please ask any questions that you have in the chat box. We will get to them at the end of this uh, presentation, and any questions or uh, any questions and answers that have not been posed during this time will be posted as well. And also, please enjoy yourself. Okay, I would like to introduce our speaker today. His name is Pierre Chabonnet. He is the Director of Passenger and Facilitation for International Air Transport Association. Many of you know it as IATA. Um, Pierre joined IATA in October 2015 to provide leadership and direction to drive the industry in improving overall passenger experience throughout the journey. And his main focus is on interaction of the passenger with airlines, airports, and other industry stakeholders. So this is going to be a, a great call. Uh, Pierre began his career with Air Canada back in 1988, and he held numerous positions in uh, with his tenure there, uh, and his 21-year tenure with the airline. And from there, Pierre moved to Canada, Canadian Air Transport Security Authority, which is CATSA, in 2009 as the Regional Director for Service Delivery. And he was effective for and efficient in the uniform service delivery of screening operations in the eastern region of Canada. Pierre graduated from École Polytechnique de l'Université de Montréal in 1988 as an industrial engineer. And at this time, I would like to welcome Pierre Chabonneau. All right, thank you very much, Carmen. It's a pleasure uh, to meet you uh, today. Um, and thanks for the kind introduction. As you can tell, uh, it uh, portrays how old I am, but I'd rather say that this is more about years of experience in the industry. Um, and um, let me get through uh, with the uh, presentation uh, that I have for you today. Um, Carmen, actually, I, I, I don't see the presentation myself on my screen. Um, I have it on my, um, oh, there you, I have it actually on my, uh, my own computer, but I, I can't see it, unfortunately. So I don't know if there's anything I'm not doing right, but I can speak to it, except I just don't see the slides. Okay, so we um, are showing, it's starting right at the beginning at the roadmap for starting aviation. And as you speak, then what we'll do is have Carly, um, and I just want to, let me just do a check. If any, everybody in the uh, 
chat boss, can, are they seeing, because I'm seeing the presentation, is everyone else seeing the presentation before we get started? If you can just type yes in the chat, okay, wonderful. Okay, so what we'll do is try to follow, and if you just want to maybe say next slide, sure. I know some people don't like to do that, but that will help us move it along so that we're on the same page as you, if you don't mind. No, I will, and I apologize for that. I don't know why it doesn't do it, but in any case, I think we will do that in six organization. So I assume the first slide you see is the, the plane with the restart for uh, re, uh, restarting aviation. So let's move to the slide number two, uh, which talks about the challenge. And um, before I get to the detail, what I would like to uh, point out for you today is that uh, obviously, we, given the situation with the with the uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, and all the impact on the industry, uh, we work very, very actively in, in setting up a, a plan that would be uh, looking at a numerous aspect uh, to, to help with the restart of the industry. And the first part of the presentation will be uh, talking about some of the challenges, what we're trying to address, uh, what are some of the main pillars of, of the uh, of the plan. And the second part goes more into details of the, the passenger experience itself and how it, it might change, whether it's in the short run or in the longer term, and, and really based on the, uh, the, the uh, medical uh, support from the advisors and uh, what it means in terms of the, 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 the process and the touch points in the journey. So I'll start first with the high level overview of the plan because it has multiple dimension and then we'll go into the, the, the passenger experience itself that might be, I guess, of interest for all of you. So obviously, start staying on page two. The challenge now is how do we restart the aviation industry while protecting, you know, the health and safety of travelers, ensuring that the airline is not a vector of, of transmitting the or transporting actually the virus to other countries. How do we make sure to restore public the public confidence in air travel and government uh, confidence as well, so that the the they have the right framework to reopen the borders in a safe way and uh, that doesn't create a, a second wave. So as I mentioned, uh, the, the thought process behind this is what measures can we do uh, to support that uh, and certainly meaning how is it going to change uh, the travel experience, certainly temporary at the beginning and hopefully getting back to some sort of normalcy in the future. So move on to slide number three. So obviously, when you look at something that broad, uh, the overall goal is that we do this work of restoring the air connectivity uh, with, uh, with some basic principles being we would like an international, internationally consistent, mutually accepted and harmonized approach. Um, so this really, really means that we need the success of the government and the health authorities and industry in general. So we, we discuss these principles, we look at the risk assessment, and we have this, um, this idea of, of mutual recognition of measures being taken by countries so that we all speak the same language and we apply the rules in a consistent way uh, because the trust element is going to be extremely important, again, for the, the reopening of the borders and for the customers to accept the travel. And uh, a bit like we've seen during the lockdown of the industry, a number of countries have taken unilateral measures uh, on their own without sort of uh, consultation. There was er certainly a sense of urgency uh, to take measures, but it led to a very, very disorganized shutdown of the industry with people stranded around the world with not no place to come back, uh, no treatment possible, no information, very disorganized. So that challenge for us was to how do we we make sure that when we reopen the industry, we do it differently, we engage all the stakeholders and we try it in a systematic way as best as possible. So moving on to slide number four, uh, that will give a bit of a sense. Uh, data is always good to share and, and fact really speak from themselves. So when we speak about the value of aviation and there are far more indicators than that one, but the main ones and why it's so important that we we we, we realize the the impact of the of the aviation uh, overall in a global uh, sense is look at the numbers you have there. It drives over uh, you know the economy is over 2.7 trillion dollars of the the GDP uh, creates around 60 66 million jobs around the world. Uh, enable enables trades around the world, deliver, delivering 35% uh, of goods by value, certainly facilitates the healthcare and the emergency aid, and basically, as you all know, connects people, business, and economy. So certainly, as we, we built the plan, it was not just about 
uh, just getting to normal, but really make make people realize just how how valuable the the aviation industry is, how critical it is for the economies, and and uh, like I said, numbers always help to put things in perspective, and uh, uh, I think that's that's the purpose of of that particular slide. If we move on to the next slide, um, the the challenge we had is how do we how do we create that roadmap how, that roadmap to restart um, the the uh, the travel uh, the travel in industry, and um, in doing so, what became very evident is that from a medical standpoint, uh, there is really um, no silver bullet in terms of. Uh, of one way to fix or to control the the epidemic, as you saw the pandemic around the world. Uh, so what was uh, what had to be discussed is how do we come up with a layered approach of of outcome based measures that will be supported by scientific evidence, and we'll get into more details afterwards. But there's really not one measure in itself that takes care of everything. And even if we all look for the vaccine, it's going to take some time before this gets in place, that get, this gets go globally distributed, that the results are safe, and so on and so forth. So in absence of that silver bullet, the, the real uh, only solution is to look at a multiple range of solutions that could be added to create this travel experience, uh, but also mitigate the risk of further transmission. Um, and, and these really have to be, again, outcome-based based and supported by scientific evidence and medical medical support. So moving on to slide number six, um, in addition of this uh, layered measure, what would be some of the guiding principles that we use to, uh, to sort of propose this roadmap? One is that we need these measures to be introduced as early as possible upstream ahead of the travel process. We want the customers and the travelers to be fit to fly before they get to the terminal. And so what are the measures that we can do to ensure that? We'll get into that a bit later on. But clearly, as you as you can sense as travelers as well, you don't want to be um, um, realizing that you can't travel once you've started the process. So what can we do ahead of time to make sure that only fit uh, fit um, fitted travelers can travel as best as they know, obviously, given the, the, the problems of the virus. But so what are those um, those measures we do? Put them uh, upstream as, as, as much as possible in the travel process. Uh, and then second second piece is we need the collaboration between government and industry, again, to create that roadmap of measures. I've touched upon it already. We need to make sure that these processes that are introduced are recognized, are harmonized. It's very important that customers have a as best as possible a predictable way to travel. So if they leave country A to go to country B, they should know ahead of time what to expect and where where, where measures will be taken place, uh, how they should behave, what happens at country of destination, if there's a, a problem. So this is where the harmonization is really important uh, between the governments and the industry. One uh, important guiding principle as well is the measures that are introduced should only last for as long as they are required with a clear exit strategy. And that is that is very important because uh, to draw a, a comparison, uh, let's say for um, after 9-11, and the, the layer of security measures that have been af added after the fact, we're, uh, we're uh, you know, many, many years after the event, and we still have some security measures that didn't, came from that, that, that very tragic event. And you would question some might not be necessary, but we, we never really removed them. And I think part of that, um, part of that now health safety measures is, uh, let's leave them, let's put them in place to restore confidence. Let's make sure we have the right evidence that they're, they're required. And once they no longer uh, risk, they are no longer necessary, we need to remove them. Otherwise, we risk having them for a long time. And that's going to be uh, some, some irritant and impediment to travel. And, and it adds cost and complexity. So if they're not required, we need to really understand what the triggers are so that we can remove them moving forward. And a final guiding principle that's really important is when we draw these measures, we need to make sure that the players in the industry understand what their roles and responsibility, responsibilities are and that they, they remain as, uh, as they were designed. And we have a few examples of that um, already, uh, one being, for instance, if, if uh, governments would require um, that temperature checks are being done uh, at the airport. Well, health measures are a responsibility of states. And so 
very important that the states realize that this should not be passed on to airline personnel to do or to, to airport personnel, because this is not the people who are qualified to do that, and this is not as per the mandate. And it's very important because when those new measures are, are implemented, and you'll see examples of, for instance, passenger data, there's a real, um, a real uh, easy trap to fall into that, that airlines would have to play a role that they're not supposed to play because they don't need this data for, for their own business. But governments could uh, take the opportunity to say, this is information you guys are best placed to collect, and uh, whereas there's, there's other ways to do that as well. So it's just, these are just examples that, as we design these processes, we want to make sure that the roles and responsibilities, uh, there's no shift of liability, no shift of responsibilities in the process. Next slide, number seven, please. That's uh, the timing of the restart plan. So in that case, when we began working on this, it was a bit earlier in the year, we were looking at where the, uh, how the situation could evolve. I would say that right now between the immediate and short term, we're sort of in that phase where we have worked very hard to develop a roadmap and measures that have been circulated to the uh, large organizations like ICAO and, uh, and with guidance from the World Health Organization uh, and uh, Airport Councils International. We all work together and a number of other organizations as well to take this document and make sure we set the tone for what uh, should be done in the short term, at least to start relieving the, the pressure on the borders and allowing uh, travel to restart. I think what's important to note in terms of timing is that domestic travel has not really stopped during all this time. It has been a lot of restrictions and a lot of reduction of travel, but there's always been a minimal domestic service that has been that has been kept alive within, within the countries where it was decided. We see now that the, the, the restart based on the implementation of the measure will probably enable a bit more um, uh, increase of domestic and probably uh, closed borders uh, discussions on, on safe reopening, uh, eventually to potential international point-to-point -point, um, uh, travel, and then eventually to back to where it was in terms of the entire network and the large network. But for that to happen, uh, as, as we describe it, you'll start with probably having some it's a, we call it manual measures, but maybe more uh, more labor intensive measures to begin with. Um, and that will get into more harmonization and more normalization, standard operating procedures. And we see that the framework is probably gonna be more systematic and, and easier uh, to, to deploy globally after we have learned uh, experience and found the best way to implement some of these measures. You'll see some also involve technology. I'll get into that a bit later. So we see that at the beginning it might be some little workarounds, but as we get the best practices and the standards, uh, these uh, measures that should stay will remain much easier to implement, to deploy, and to use by the by the customers and by the, the governments and the various uh, parties involved. Moving to slide number eight, um, that's the last slide I'll get before we get to the uh, to the detailed travel experience. This talks about the overall vision of the IATA restart plan, and and you have to look at this into two main pillars. The, the two um, areas on the left the system that, that goes under system restart, what we mean by that is that, first of all, we need to get uh, the planes back in the air. So it uh, means that uh, everything under the system capability pillar, uh, is, is, is these are all items and actions that need to take place so that the airlines themselves are able to restart uh, their operation. And it's technical details like making sure that there's enough slot capability around around the world, that the, the ground, uh, the pilots and the ground uh, and the crew and the ground staff who have been either laid off or haven't flown for a while uh, need to have a way to get recertified very quickly or get their licenses extended so that they can go back uh, to the sky. And these are. Um, Obviously, it involves safety safety discussions, but this is where we work with states to make sure that there's a recognition of, of this challenge and, and how do we get the, our crews to be able to fly again in a safe way, but also considering the fact that they had probably less hours given of all the, the reduction in the industry. So we have to really work with the, with the licensing and certification uh, process to make sure that this is safe. 
there's been a number of layoffs, obviously, because of the downside of the economy. So uh, the staffing levels for many companies is now problematic. People have been furloughed, they've been laid off. Uh, how do we get them back into the industry and, and ready to work? Uh, the whole airworthiness of the aircraft is, is uh, also of importance. There's never been as many aircraft grounded around the world, and that brings a lot of technical challenges in terms of the maintenance of these aircraft, even while they're on the ground. Uh, the fuel that's on board these, uh, these airplanes have to be checked so there's no contamination. So uh, there's uh, inspections to be done. And again, there's, uh, there's now a massive uh, number of people that have been um, uh, put, put on the side. So this whole restart of the airline capability uh, is really is really key, as well as the rest of the supply chain. So the air air, nav air navigation strategic um, service providers uh, also have the same challenges of bringing back air traffic controllers, bring them up back back to speed. Uh, get the capacity, the capacity ready in the sky, the ground handlers with their staff, airport operators, and also to bring the terminal back to capacity. So this first bucket really has to do with the, the, uh, the ability for the system to restart. The second bucket, which I'll get into more details after, is the travel experience. So how do we make sure that we have this layer of biosafety measures that ensures that we don't transmit and we don't uh, transport the uh, the virus and and create this second wave uh, of of um, of, uh, of of virus. So uh, I now get into uh, the, in the rest of the presentation. So what are the process on the ground and in the air uh, to make sure we have this uh, this risk mitigated? And by doing these two, what we then have to do is to make sure that now that the system will be able to restart, we need to kick off the demand. So how do we work on, on, uh, on getting the, the industry to create this demand for customers uh, to, to want to travel and for governments to reopen the borders? And, and this is beyond now the, 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 the airline industry, but the rest of the travel and tourism uh, uh, network and ecosystem. So. The uh, right part of the presentation, the two buckets and sort of the, 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 the reddish color or rose color there, really talk about uh, a series of measures that we need to do to restore confidence for governments and, and passengers. So how do governments uh, relax restrictions, whether on safety bubbles between countries, uh, where they feel safe that the the the, the virus is, has been under control. How do we ensure reciprocity between those countries that they, they respect what the other one is doing and they trust it? Uh, big, big item on guidance for customers. How do we provide sufficient communication and reassurance to customers so that they feel they feel comfortable booking and confident to fly, know what to expect along the way uh, in their travel journey? There's uh, issues about the travel insurance as well that uh, clearly need to be addressed and, and rethought of moving forward. Um, many customers were stranded during the, the, the lockdown, uh, not having clauses to protect them with the COVID, and but just uh, the whole network has been struggling between the, the vouchers and the refunds and. Um, the, uh, the view from the insurance companies and the credit cards. So this has been quite problematic for the customers. So uh, this is an opportunity uh, when we restart to, to look at this in, in, as, a, as an economy and say, and as a system, and how do we make sure that we have a good uh, insurance program in place that would really make sh uh, the travelers uh, feel comfortable to travel. Uh, how do we open destination? So this is beyond the travel industry, but how do we make sure that the um, the customers when they go to uh, to uh, decide to travel somewhere that they know there's something to do that the the, uh, the transportation systems are up and running that the hotels are up and running that things they want to see are are available to see so how do we reopen this destination so there's a lot of work being done with the industry partners um, and the tourism industry uh, to to build on on the the beyond uh, air travel uh, perspective. And at the same time, um, how do we make sure that the industry is, is still recognized for its safety and security along the way and would demonstrate that uh, the measures taken are, are, um, are giving confidence again that there's no risk from a, from a, a, a health perspective and also from the, the ecological standpoint as well. The last bucket really is about stimulating demand itself. Um, how do we, and this is a lot of work to, uh, that we're doing with governments to 
provide financial incentives such as tax reliefs or just uh, uh, sort of that sort of incentives that would help uh, again uh, stimulating and encouraging people to travel how do we uh, work with our tourism uh, boards around the world and countries to uh, promote uh, to do a lot of marketing about destination again and just uh, making people want to travel and the visa facilitation part in the end really has to do with uh, the fact that we want to make sure that governments um, are not imposing additional visa restrictions for people to travel or increase the cost of a visa to cope for the cost of certain measures that could be taken place, which could be detrimental for uh, customers who want to travel. And we're also looking in the longer term to make this uh, visa request even easier. Some countries still work with very old ways of, of asking for visa, their paper copies, and you leave your passport in offices. And so we have to uh, modernize this, make it easy, make it very slick, uh, automated, and electronic. And so, uh, and, and at the same time, if we can remove the cost of visa, that'll be, or reduce it at least, that'll be uh, maybe ways to incentivize and simulate demand. So moving on now to the, the passenger experience, uh, this is where I want to spend a bit more time. And this is uh, something I guess that you see every day when you read the news around the world about slide number nine. Uh, it really is about uh, what you read in, in terms of your travel experience and what, what the, you see in airports or airplanes uh, um, and, and as you would feel as a traveler. If I move to slide number 10, what the, uh, what the thinking again uh, for that one was to look at every touch point. So we follow the customer journey. We look at every touch point uh, of the customer and we see what measures could be uh, applicable in each of these touch points to again, mitigate the risk of, the, of transmission. And it goes into a, a far, uh, far amount of, uh, of details. Um, you see in the heading talks about the biosecurity measures. Actually, the, the right term now that's been sort of generally accepted is more biosafety measures uh, as opposed to biosecurity. Uh, it's technical, but it, it's a different meaning to that. Um, and so what I'll go, uh, we'll cover over the next couple of slides is, is a bit of the measures that we have uh, developed, again, with the experts to say uh, this is something that, that customers should be doing uh, in that multi-layered approach so that it mitigates the risk of, of the transmission. So if I move to slide 11 and I start going on a sort of step-by-step -step process, um, again, um, when we talk about pre-flight, uh, you hear probably and you read a lot about uh, go governments wanted to have more information about travelers, about their health declarations, about tracing, meaning where have they traveled before, where do they plan to travel, uh, contact details like their phone numbers and addresses and, so, and, uh, and, and um, you know, full names and all of that stuff. The point here is that we want customers to be interacting more and more directly with governments uh, and we're advocating for governments to set up portals so that this information is all shared before travel. Uh, there's a number of governments that have put very easy to follow websites and I'm just going to name Vietnam as an example. There's a very easy process where a customer goes online uh, and requests a, a, a visa to travel, but they will provide a very easy help form to, to fill out, provide all the customer information, everything government needs to know, and, and the government gets an, a, a, gives an acknowledgement of the, uh, to the customer about the, uh, the, the okay to travel, if you will, uh, including the health declaration and the symptoms that, that that would require. This is a very important piece because um, the end of the airline industry has a lot of pressure to be the, um, the unit that would gather this information. But this, not, this is not information the airlines need to have to run their business. The health status of a citizen and the risk assessment of a country deciding if someone can travel is really, it's really a state responsibility. It's not an airline responsibility. What the airlines need to know is that the government has given the authority to travel the same way you would ask for a visa. Airlines are not processing visas. We just want to know that the customer is okay to travel. So we're really putting a lot of focus with governments to make sure that the customers are all uh, ready, uh, providing the right information and get all the right travel authorization, including the health status before they do travel. Then following up, uh, once you get to the airport, there's new measures that we have advocated for. Um, in fact, I said to the airport, even before you get there, 
anything you can do at home in terms of preparation, so getting your mobile check-in done, uh, if you're allowed to print your own printed back tag and you can do it, uh, do it at home, if you can use electronic back tags on your bag, get all of this prepared before you go to the airport. That's going to minimize your contact and your interface with airline personnel or with kiosks and, and hard devices, and that would get you really, really uh, ready to uh, prepare to fly and uh, have cell control over your journey. So the two uh, first areas are really about being prepared to fly. Then when you get to the airport, this is what you read uh, pretty much in, in, in a lot of the news is, uh, first of all, there's discussions about uh, maybe restricting access for the time being to only travelers. Uh, maybe people who don't need to travel who just go and greet uh, get, greet travelers uh, should not be allowed only to restrict the uh, the crowd at a minimum to begin with. It's just an, a, a, a suggestion for for limiting crowds, especially if airports are doing different measures on temperature screening uh, and, and and that type of uh, of measures. The more people you have, obviously, the the, the more people it takes and the more space it takes. So. Um, just maybe minimize the access to begin with. And then you have a series of measures about temperature screening. Uh, we, again, advocate that this should be done on the move. There is thermal ca screening cameras that exist today where uh, people don't have to stop one by one, but you can be on the move and, and you're captured if you have suspected of, uh, not suspected, but if you have a high body temperature. These measures are not in themselves 100% uh, um, correct. There's a lot of uh, failures and flaws in some of them. That's why it's multi-layered approach. So you get the temperature screening, uh, respect physical distancing. Airports are working really hard to put these uh, tracking devices on the floor and help you just maintain that distance, wear the masks and increase sanitization in just about everything you see in every aspect of the terminal, more cleaning, more frequency, more product, so that we, um, you know, this is, this the customers feel safe with that environment. Quick word on testing and immunity passport. There's also a lot of discussion about testing. The, the key critical piece with testing here, for this to be the right or, or a potential solution, you need uh, four, well, actually three very important things, speed, scalability and reliability. And at this point, the, none of the tests that are being uh, developed in the world have that, that situation. There's no global test that is acceptable. It's not fast. The results take time to get. There's a lot of uh, the best test that's been put out there has got a 95% uh, reliability factor, which means you, the five, if you get an airport at 50,000 passengers a day and there's 5% errors, you get 2,500 passengers that can have either false positive or false negatives, what really gives um, issues in term, and headaches in terms of people that you let go that were tested negative but are testing positive on the arrival at the other end, or people that uh, you actually stop and they actually are not uh, contagious. So testing is um, is not as a silver bullet as people would think, and there's the issue of, of cost as well, which is really important to resolve once this becomes available, uh, because as an example, uh, you have some uh, countries that are opening corridors right now that would require that you test on departure and you test on arrival and the same thing on the return when you get home. So as a traveler, you have four tests to travel and some countries, the one test will cost you over $200 US. So imagine uh, $800 US of test that sometimes could be more expensive than your plane ticket. So the cost of test is also an issue in there. So we, we are not so fond on the, on the future of testing at this point anyways, unless something becomes really, really more effective and quick. And for therefore, people have also talked about health passports and immunity passports. The, the virus has not been there long enough to grant immunity to anyone who may have had it. There's no guarantee on that. So uh, medical advisors are really not recommending anything related to that at this point because it's, it's not in place and it's not, it's not giving any additional value. Uh, the last piece on airport that you will definitely see, and that is probably a good news that because it's, it's going to stay beyond the virus, is the whole notion of contactless technology and biometrics and um, removing the need uh, for people to touch the, the, the physical, physical equipment. Um, there's a far, a far uh, or a big acceleration of these solutions right now, which will make comfortable uh, customers feel more comfortable, comfortable to use 
their their mobile phones and and issue their boarding pass and their bag tags and so on and so forth and then uh, self scan when it's time to go to the gate for instance or entry access or user biometrics so uh, this is a this is um, in all in all bad stories I guess there's opportunities this is one where we feel uh, is going to be a benefit for the industry to accelerate the transformation from a technology standpoint. I only have a couple of slides left. Uh, following on, uh, boarding, uh, slide number 12, we're in the boarding process. Uh, also, some changes probably in the way that the, the airlines will board the plane or try to get more discipline in terms of boarding the plane from the back to the front and also with having the, the aisle, the windows and then the aisles. Uh, again, this, this is very theoretical because not everyone uh, shows up at the, at the gate at the time, so this is just suggestions for best practices. But, um, but the process would also include more cell scanning by customers, so there's no exchange of documents between gate agents and customers when technology can allow it. Uh, also, there's a, a suggestion at the beginning, which might uh, sound kind um, uh, popular, I guess, which, which, which is to limit the amount of carry-on baggage that uh, customers would have, but there's a lot of positive uh, from a, first from a health standpoint, although uh, it's not the primary driver, but uh, obviously uh, there's there's risk of the you know the the, the transmission or, or carrying the the contact uh, surface. Um, the less baggage you have, I guess you limit that. But more importantly, uh, the fact that you can board a plane faster. Uh, you've all traveled on planes where everyone is scrambling to put their carry-on baggage on on top of the plane, and it takes a bit more time. Uh, you get close contact with people trying to help you or flight attendants or whatnot. So, this is this is probably at the beginning a good thing to try, and and also when you get either on a tight connecting flight or if you uh, if you actually have to uh, to the plane faster on arrival to allow for more time for cabin grooming. Uh, this, these are precious seconds that are, can be uh, can be gained also in the entire ecosystem, and um, the less carry-on baggage you have as well, uh, when you go to security check uh, the checkpoints, as you know, um, if there is less baggage to check, then this is also a faster flow. So, at the beginning, you have to see this particular measure in the entire end-to-end -end flow, and if there's extra measures taken, that should take more time. Some could be relieving that that uh, time frame as well, and and help you uh, get to. Uh, a a fast and smooth journey as well. So, but airlines will have to decide if they decide it's just a recommendation to try. Um, using biometrics will be important as well, wherever it's possible. On board, um, this is this is very um, a lot of questions about the onboard experience. Uh, and the uh, primary one was, do we need to leave that seat, uh, that empty seat between passengers and, and the empty space? There is no medical evidence right now that, that that is clear enough to say that there's high risk of transmissions on board. And that's why we have advocated against this. Uh, it's not primarily economical reason, although it will be a huge one. But given all of the various factors, such as the fact that the airflow is is uh, change uh, is uh, regularly uh, 20 or 30 times more than any other uh, uh, mode of transport or even hospitals sometimes. The use of filters, the way that people sit all the, facing uh, the same direction. There are a number of, category, uh, of reasons why this is not necessary and the in-flight uh, experts have worked on different processes also uh, to uh, look at the different catering aspect and, and uh, the wearing of uh, protective equipment also to minimize the risk on board. Uh, on arrival at airport, again, some, uh, some uh, uh, countries will want to do um, checks on arrival. Uh, we, we'd like that they the recognize the work that was done on departure, and if it's done properly, there should be less risk on arrival. Might not be there at the beginning, but let's make sure that we, we follow the same processes. If more bags are being delivered at the, at the belt, uh, let's have a process that maybe give more distance or use different belts and more space, sorry, more space for customers uh, to claim their bags. At border and customs, uh, make full use of electronic uh, means. Uh, if you can do something on departure that would avoid to do something on arrival, let's make sure these governments are coordinated in terms of these measures and eliminate the paper forms. Uh, and finally, the last uh, um, the one to last slide is the transit process. 
Um, clearly, there's interesting stories about the transit process. Some countries right now have decided that when a customer is in connection, uh, there should not be any particular measures for that customer to connect to the other country because they're not staying in there. Uh, but some other countries are still decided to do some tests and, ch and check. But it creates it did create some some problems where uh, because it's not harmonized that some people were intercepted on arrival and taken to different uh, different uh, uh, facilities and it, it, this is not harmonized yet. So we're advocating for uh, mutual recognition of this means and and taking care of the fact that the country A would do the proper uh, measures so that you don't have to do this during the connection process. So in conclusion, I realize I've taken a lot of time and I want to make sure that time for question. Conclusion, again, is that there's really still no single measure that will mitigate the, the biosafety risk. It's still a range of measures. We have to make sure that they're properly implemented, that we monitor them, that we have triggers to remove them when it's safe enough to, uh, to travel. And we keep looking at the uh, medical advice from uh, from the World Health Organizations and uh, and the results we have on on the the, the medical front. Um, but looking for an harmonized way to restore confidence, and hopefully uh, countries will will line up and customers will will get back on on in the air. So that's it. Um, that's it, uh, Carmen. <laughs> back to Thank the crowd now. <laughs> no, this is wonderful and very good information. For those of you who are on here, I trust that you were able to um, take some notes as I was taking notes. I think thinking about your return to travel, I know that many of you have reached out to me and we've had conversations from email about return to travel, but hopefully this will give you a great guideline uh, as to what you're thinking about for your different companies and the culture of your company and also your risk appetite. So this, I think, will be is a great guide for that. And also for you suppliers, maybe something that Pierre has said may cause you to adjust some of your uh, your protocols in your cleaning and just how you approach things. I, know, I see that there are some guidelines from IATA. Um, and at this time, I will turn this over to Tanya, who will pose if, uh, any questions that have come through on the chat. If you do have a question, please make sure you post it in the chat, and then we will allow Pierre uh, the time to answer those questions. Tanya? Thanks, Carmen. There's actually not any questions at the current moment in the chat box, but if you do have questions, please put them in there and we will address them. I can't imagine no one has questions. <laughs> I, I cannot be that clear for sure. <laughs> No, there are no questions coming through. Oh, really fun. So we've got some comments that it's been really informative. I think, Pierre, they're probably just taking some of this information in. Um, but I do have a couple of questions because uh, I've had some questions come across from our travelers and wanting to know, uh, I guess their their opinion or their perception is that the airline is probably the the most effective right now in terms of or the most the highest risk to travel, and some of them have opted to take you know ground transportation versus. Maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I wish I knew more about the other modes of transport, but I think what we when we discussed the um, the risk actually to these um, to the the travel piece, we're also asking the other industry like the trains and the bus and everything else so if for instance if we're taking if, if we believe that um, it's important to respect a, a, a whatever a meter distance for 1.5 meter um, on, on, a, on a plane or, or, or on the, in the airport what's the rationale in the trains what's the rationale in the buses and stuff like that so how is that different and I think for us when we look again at the um, the, the the way that at least the the sanitization and the air is the airflow is happening on board the plane. This is the first uh, first avenue we looked at where we think that there's an edge over the other modes of transport only because the the way that because the aircraft are so high in altitude to begin with the air that is being taken and, and transmitted inside the plane is not the same as the ground level. So um, so again, but but so I think from our standpoint, and we are actually a couple of points since I've got a few minutes. We are actually working with the NASA on a, on a study, the unbiased study completely that would help. 
not convince, but provide information to travelers to to feel safe about traveling on board a plane. And we don't want uh, this this word to come only from the airlines, because as I mentioned before, it's very easy for uh, for people to say, of course, the airlines will tell me it's safe to fly. They want me to be on the plane. It's you know they they want to make money and everything else. So we're looking for the we're looking for um, uh, for partners and and aircraft manufacturers and and uh, but again, but also unbiased experts who who will tell uh, the, the travelers this is not um, this is not more dangerous to fly on a plane than other modes of transport. Wonderful, thank you, Tanya. I think there are a couple of questions now. Mm, there is a question. The ideas of the coordinated consolidated process across jurisdictions is the hope. Is there any idea if, when such an approach will be reality? Thanks for the question, uh, Kelly. I think the, there's one thing also I've got time to mention now and that I, I should have added in the presentation. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a group or a workforce that has been put together by ICAO. You may have heard uh, the name, it's called the CART. It's a Council Aviation Recovery Task Force. Um, that group is made up of the states, many, many states around the world, uh, IATA, uh, Airport Council International, and the World Health Organization also that put the guidance I just explained in, in a bit more detail, and that document has been distributed. There's been guidance produced um, uh, or in a month period. It was quite fast for such a large undertaking, and that document has been, has been shared with the countries around the world for them to look into and see already if they would comply with the guidance that's in there. So there's already a lot of movement around the globe to look at the guidance and work with the states to see and the health authorities of these various countries to see if they line up with those recommendations. And that is right now probably the best the best tool that the tool that the, the states will look for to harmonize those measures. Um, as I said before, there's a there's a lot of I don't say wishful thinking. I think all the measures that are recommended are based by by medical evidence. What I feel will happen again is that the states will look at obviously other measures than just these ones. States will start to look at, okay, if I'm for instance in New Zealand now, it's just, it's just declared that they have zero cases of, of COVID. Uh, if I'm the health authority, I'm going to say, fine, what criteria will I use to reopen what country B? Uh, one might just be, I want to see if they have uh, proper control of the virus in their own country. Uh, is there a sufficient uh, 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 medical capability if something happens? Uh, how do they treat a quick, uh, you know, quick uh, situations or urgent situations? Do they have medical tests in sufficient uh, aspects? So. There's other um, criteria than just the airline sector, and I think that's how the bubbles are going to open up. But right now, uh, the discussions are taking place between states to just engage and mutually recognize that if we both follow these sets of rules, we're ready to open between us. And that's the way we think it's going to go um, uh, a bit slowly, like I said, closer to your borders and then probably open up more in an inter international way. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And, and for any of you that um, may have some questions later, please send those to us and email those to us. We will be happy to send them over to Pierre and get those answered and then post those as well. But I really want to thank you all for being on here. As you know, we have been having these biweekly calls, and hopefully they've been uh, very informative to you, something that you can take away. Our next call will be on uh, Thursday, June 25th at 1 o'clock from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and we will be having a conversation, a travel manager conversation. We'll have a panel, and we will be sending that information out to you in our next invite. But thank you all, and now you have about 10 minutes back in your day. But thank you again for joining us, and everyone have a great and productive week. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.